Hey everyone, my name is Lance, and this is Amped About Aimpad. So it's been a couple of months since we've had a video, and I thought you might be interested in what we've been up to. So I've been focusing a lot on the firmware and making it basically as solid as I possibly can. I've kind of demonstrated the features and technologies and shown how things can just work fantastic and work great, and when they do, it is fantastic and it is great. But uh, as we've been developing this technology, we've been noticing that there are situations and there are times where it's not great and things can go horribly, horribly wrong. So we've been focusing on how we can prevent those bad things from happening. And uh, we've developed both new firmware and uh, made some modifications in the PCV and other things. And I'd like to dive into what those kind of potential problems are and how we can prevent them from happening. All right, so for this segment, I think it'd be most beneficial to kind of demonstrate the difference between an analog signal and a digital signal. I'm not going to go into too much technical detail, but for our purposes here, we're going to treat this little curvy line as an analog signal and this digital signal as this blocky-ish one. So the easiest way to demonstrate the differences between these two is the digital signal is either on or off. So if I type on a keyboard and I push the key, it's either being pushed or it's not being pushed. And uh, that's kind of like this is being sensed as it's not being pushed and this is being sensed as it's pushed or, or vice versa. On an analog signal, you have a gradual increase of, of that uh, signal. So if I switch aimpad here, you can see as I push the key in a small amount, it increases these values incrementally from 0 all the way to 100. Uh, and that, that's the difference between an analog and a digital signal. Now, digital signals are very easy to deal with uh, on keyboards and things like that because you're either pushing a key or you're not pushing a key. And when you push it, you want the key to register or you don't want it to register when you're not pushing it. Um, and there's very little that can go wrong. With analog signals, all sorts of crazy stuff can happen. So I like to show this kind of picture of what we like to call noise. So noise is basically any signal on that analog input that you weren't intending for, that you weren't expecting, and it causes your whole analog curve not being that nice little uh, curvy line, but it has a bunch of little jaggy stuff going on. So when you combine the signal that you are producing or trying to measure and the noise that you can't really anticipate or don't know what to do with exactly, uh, you don't have this nice little straight line. It's kind of mess messy. And so we have to do a few different things to kind of filter that out and try to get rid of this noise as much as we can. Um, so the, the several things that can go wrong with aimpad is, is for example, the, the sensors themselves can be sensitive to temperatures. So if I were to take our aimpad keyboard out into the, the cold Indiana weather, um, fortunately we're not in the winter anymore, but I did do a lot of testing taking our, our prototypes out into the cold winter and uh, leave them out for, for, you know, for an hour or so, and then would bring them inside. Um, if I calibrated the, the uh, prototype outside and then brought it inside, over time what would happen on the, uh, the signal is it would start to like, it would sense that it needed to be at a certain range, but it would add a little bit of noise the warmer and warmer and warmer it got until it got to room temperature, and then it would stabilize. But basically, if I were to, to take it outside and then bring it inside, and leave it there for an hour, you'd have a problem where the keyboard would look like this, where it, you'd have a bunch of unexpected signal off to the side, and then you'd either have to force the user to recalibrate and, and all sorts of things like that, and, and that was pretty, pretty horrible. Um, another problem that we came across was that we noticed that the LEDs on the keyboards are actually causing some problems. So if I were to, uh, let me use this kind of weight here, so if I take a look at this uh, measurement up here, you can see it's, it's stuck at 370 and 374. So on previous videos, you might have noticed that this value kind of fluctuates a lot. Um, we've eliminated a bunch of noise so that no longer happens. Um, but if I add this uh, little calibration or this, this uh, lighting routine, you can see the keyboard's lighting up. And basically, because we're using an, an infrared signal, the red LED actually causes some interaction with the infrared sensor. So you can see that these values are kind of fluctuating all over the place from when it senses that the red LED is on and when it is off. And it adds, in this case, it goes from 373 to 391. So it's about a 2% uh, amount of noise between when it's on and when it's off. Now 2% may not be that big of a deal. It's a pretty small amount. And I've played games running in this mode with, with uh, it constantly flashing the red LED on and off, and uh, it's really, really hard to tell. But if you're sensitive to it like I am, it is annoying, and it's something that I don't want to happen. So uh, that that was another issue that we came across. Uh, the other issue is with objects and things like uh, 
I don't know, let's say people wanted to eat a, a Cheeto around their keyboard. And if that Cheeto got crunched up and mashed up and as they're feeding their face and getting the Cheeto dust all over the beautiful keyboard and it gets inside the keyboard and winds its way underneath that switch where, where we're sensing this analog signal, all of a sudden we have the Cheeto in the way causing us to have problems with reading what the key is actually doing. Please don't eat Cheetos in front of your keyboard, it's horrible. But if you do, because Cheetos are quite tasty, I would recommend uh, trying to fix this problem. And, and so we, we've come up with some ways to do that. So to help demonstrate how we solve that problem, I'm going to actually unplug this keyboard and uh, plug in something else. So I'll get this out of the way. And this is a sample that we produced specifically to solve all these problems. So the, the first one that we were talking about was temperature. And uh, this particular sample actually has a, a basically an automated calibration process. So no longer is it necessary for the user to hit a calibration sequence and then like push all the keys all the way down and get some nice uh, range of, of what's possible on the keys. It does it all automatically. So the user doesn't have to do anything with calibration. It just does it automatically. So I was able to take this sample outside, uh, leave it out in the cold, bring it inside for the room temperature, and it over time senses that things have changed and it just fixes itself automatically. Um, the other thing with LEDs, so if I uh, show this sample here, I'll switch it so it's blinking red and, and blue. Um, we've actually changed the LEDs that we're using on here. They're actually quite a bit brighter and uh, are mounted in a different way. But uh, you can see it has the red LED that's turned on and the blue LED turns off or vice versa. So it's basically flashing on and off. So one would expect that if the red LED is on and then the blue LED turns off that the values would change because there's that noise issue. But if I go ahead and put this on here, you'll see it does not change at all. 0.041 and 0.068 makes no change whatsoever. So we've completely eliminated the problem with the red LED causing some interactions. So uh, that was good news. Now, the uh, Cheeto. The Cheeto is a really pain in the booty to fix, um, but we did. And the way that I, I uh, ended up testing this was I got some laminate and laminated a Cheeto and then cut off some segments of that uh, Cheeto into these little uh, slides that contain Cheeto residue. And uh, basically what I like to demonstrate is that I can introduce a Cheeto sample into the keyboard. And I'll kind of center this a little bit. So if I take this, I'll go ahead and, and watch this uh, up in the, the top right corner of when I introduce this sample and what happens to the keyboard. So if I go ahead and push this underneath there, you can see that the signal is getting interaction because it's blocking some of that light. So I'm going to stick it right there. You can see it's 0.394 right now. I'm not going to move anything at all. And I'm just going to let this uh, sample think, OK, guess what? I fixed it. I fixed it all by itself. It, it fixed itself completely just by me not doing anything at all. And if the user had some cat hair or some Cheeto residue that happened to wind its way into the switch, um, it's no longer a problem. So you'll see if I take it away, I can have the exact same measurements I had before. There is no problem. So if I go ahead and add that noise again, it's uh, 0 0.061 and I still have this range. It's kind of interacted. I, I, oh, and it fixed itself again. 0 to 100, 0 to 100. So we have this automated calibration process that's happening uh, behind the scenes. The user doesn't have to do anything, doesn't have to do any manipulation of the keyboard or whatever. They just have nothing to do. It just automatically calibrates itself constantly as the, the user is using it. So we fixed, fixed all those problems completely. As is tradition, I've decided to play a game that has particularly good analog movement, and today's game is called Outlast. And Outlast is a game that is uh, based around a reporter who is investigating an insane asylum. And uh, much creepiness ensues, and much blood and horror and nightmarish fuel is uh, found in this wonderful game. But um, 
it also has fantastic analog movement. You can see his legs there are moving and, and based off of how far down I'm pushing down the key. Um, I can move left and right and excellent, excellent analog movement. Um, the other ability that I have in terms of control of movement in this game is I can analog lean left and right. So if I have that map to Q, I can analog lean to the left and analog lean to the right. So I have full control over my head to look at everything that is going to be creepiness around me and can also sneak around at any speed that I want. If I want to go full speed, I just push down the key all the way and it's basically no different. Now if I switch to this normal keyboard mode with the LEDs turning red, um, the movement you can see is just, uh, I don't know, it's artificial and it's it's jarring. And if you're used to playing first person shooters with a keyboard and mouse, it probably is not something you've thought about, but it's not that big of a deal. It just, it just doesn't make that much of a problem. But for me, having gotten used to playing analog control movement games, it feels horrible. It just doesn't have the same feel of control. And in this game that is full of atmosphere and full of, of dread, because you don't know what's going to be actually be happening in the game, um, the way that you move matters a lot. So if I'm moving full speed, it's just kind of like I'm getting from point A to point B. It's just like, this is my next thing. I'm going to go here and open up this door, and I'm going to go over this door. It's not that that great, and, and you don't feel like your movement really matters. Now, if I switch it back to analog movement, what I do matters tremendously, and I can look through things slightly and... I can build up the, t the tension that is mounting because I have full control over where and how I'm moving. So there's this door ahead of me. And I don't know what's on the other side of that door. And this game is like freaking me out. And I, I don't know if I really want to open that door, right? The prompt tells me that I can push the key to open the door. But what's in there? It, it, can I peek and see maybe if I want to like lean a little bit? What's, what's There's some blood on the ground. That can't be good. Do I really want to open that door? I don't know. But if I switch it to digital mode, I have Q and E still mapped to lean left and right. But if I push Q, I'm leaning at the other end of the wall. It's like, no, I want to peek inside there to see what's in there before I open up this door. I, I can't do that without like maybe tapping and then I can kind of, oh, okay, now I can see, but that's not. That's, that's immersion breaking, right? That's not the way to play a game that's like this, that it, you want to be able to lean in and see what is going on. Now, I can also click and hold this door, and I actually have analog control over how fast this door is open. So I can hold it closed, or I can open it up a little bit based off of how far down I'm pushing the key. Uh, with the keyboard, you don't have that gradual control. So I... And it's still hesitant to open this door, <laughs> but I'm basically... All right, let's just see. Ah! Yeah, see, I just... I just don't want to open that door. <laughs> um, so keeping with the theme of this game with lots of problems, um, I'm going to solve the problem of Outlast by just noping right on out of this game. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed that video. As I showed, things can go horribly wrong, but we've developed the technology to the point where even if those horrible things happen, we can correct them and account for them and still make it fantastic. We still have some very exciting things coming up shortly. If you are interested in what those are, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching.